Hi there, and welcome to the Love or Leave the Law podcast with your hosts, Adam Olette and Casey Berman. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Love or Leave the Law podcast. Uh, I am Casey Berman. So happy to have you. Uh, my podcast partner Adam is not here today. We're going to miss him, but he has had a fantastic retreat, a journaling retreat. Uh, We're going to hear all about it uh, next time when he's on. Uh, He's doing some great writing, some great journaling, uh, really getting able to get his thoughts out on paper. He's got a few books in mind, so I wish I could be there with him, but I'm holding down the fort while he's gone, but uh, we'll hear about that next time. Um, We have a great journaler, uh, a great writer on our podcast today. I am very excited about this. We have Amy Impelizari. Uh She is joining us from Pennsylvania. Let me give a little intro and then we're going to dive in. This is going to be a great podcast. Um, very excited to have you and I'm very excited to have Amy. So she spent over 13 years as a corporate litigator in New York City and then she left. And she left to do what so many of us want to do, which is to write, to write novels. Um, and that she's done. Uh, She's written novels, Lemongrass Hope, in October of 2014, which became a bestseller on Amazon. Um, She wrote Secret of Worry Dolls in 2016 and has a new novel, The Truth About Thea, um, which is coming out in October of this year, 2017. But she also wrote Lawyer Interrupted, which is uh, for the American Bar Association, which is what we're going to talk about today. I was honored to be interviewed in, in a small portion of this. She got my thoughts about leaving law. But if you can see, it's about successfully transitioning from the practice of law and back again. We're going to talk to Amy about her path and what she's done. She's going to give some great tips and tricks about how you can leave the law and also talk about her book. And I'm probably going to ask her a bit about how some of us aspiring writers can actually get started. So Amy, welcome to Love or Leave the Law. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Casey. So happy. So happy to have you. Very excited. We've talked before. I've talked about coming on the podcast. So so happy it's a reality. Tell everyone where you're calling in from. So I am calling in from Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, this is where I relocated to in 2010. It's about an hour away from where I grew up in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Great. And um, after um, going to law school in Washington, D.C. and clerking there and living there and then living in New York for 13 years, yeah. um, I circled back to Pennsylvania. Great. So been here since 2010, yeah. And I'm in San Francisco. We have people listening all over the world. Technology is great. So It is. <laughs> I'm very excited. I'd like everyone maybe uh, tell a bit, you know, what law school you went to, clerking, give a little bit of background. But you say on your website you were a reformed corporate litigator. Now you're an award-winning author. But, you know, tell us about your story. How, tell us about these 13 years. So I was never going to do anything but practice law. Um, I started college with the goal of eventually going to law school. I went to college uh, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I was never going to be anything but a lawyer. I majored in English and philosophy, and I went straight to law school. I went to George Washington National Law Center in D.C. And I um, actually, during my third year, I did a research paper on a very um, innovative program that was that was ongoing at the time. It was still sort of new. Um, and it was a branch of the Court of Federal Claims. The Court of Federal Claims in DC has jurisdiction over claims against the government. Mm-hmm. And they had started a program for vaccine compensation. So um, they had removed the vaccine um, compensation from the tort system. And it was a very unique system. And I did a paper on it and um, sent my paper to the um, chief special master of the court and ultimately got a clerkship. So I did my federal clerkship at the court of federal claims and we had national jurisdiction. So we traveled all over the country hearing vaccine injury claims. And I did that for two years and loved it and actually very much cemented my um, Ah. path towards litigation. That's really what I wanted to be a litigator. When did you not, you love, you love that. mm -hmm. When did you start not liking law? Yeah, I always say I actually loved practicing law until I didn't. And and that happened at the, that really happened pretty close to the end because by the time I didn't love practicing law, I had to get out. So I, 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 I actually went from my clerkship to a sort of boutique litigation firm that only hired law clerks. So we immediately, you know, had case files from the day we walked in. I worked there for three years litigating. Yeah. 
tried my first case um, before I was 30 and, and, and loved it. And right. then I left, I actually got an offer from Skadden Arps in Manhattan yeah. and I left and I remember actually going into the, one of the senior partners and telling him I had gotten this, this job offer that I was going to yeah. take. And I remember him saying to me, I don't know if you're going to be happy there. And I really thought that was really crazy because it was Skadden Arps yeah. and Right. Of course, I was going to be so happy there. And he said, you know, you're a litigator. And uh, it's a different kind of litigation at yeah. a big firm. And, yeah. um, and he turned out to be, it turned out to be right. Yeah. But I did have amazing experiences yeah. there. Because now it's litigation in this huge scale. And I did work on a litigation team there. Yeah. Um, I did not want to go in and do um, transactional work there. So I did go in and I did go on a litigation team. And again, we actually traveled across the country. Um, doing litigation, we were, we worked with a lot of local counsel, but yeah. when the cases went to trial, we actually moved our whole trial team in and set up shop and yeah. all over the country. And, um, and then it just started to, I started to burn out. Yeah. And so I really, like I said, I loved it until I didn't. And yeah. then I wanted out. <laughs> what, what was, first of all, you were always going to be an attorney growing up. I was too. Like, can you tell oh, some people, because a lot of us wrestle with it. Like, why am I getting, why am I unhappy with the career that I've been thinking about or people have told me I should be since I was five or 10 or right. 15? Well, tell me about that. Well, here, here's what I have sort of come to, because I wrestled with this. Don't think that this was an easy transition for me. Yeah. And the truth was, the funny thing was, I actually didn't leave the law. So what happened was I actually was offered a chance in 2009. Um, if you remember, that was a very volatile time yes. in uh, across the country. But in New York City, um, shortly after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, it was a very volatile time in the New York economic markets. Right. And so a lot of law firms were laying off. Right. And Scadden's M and A department was quite slow. I was not in the M and A department. Litigation never slows down. But instead of laying off, Scadden did this sort of very pioneering idea of offering across the board transactional and litigation attorneys could apply for a one year sabbatical, mm. and you would get a subsidized salary. Um, basically, it was a third of your your salary, and you were supposed to sort of go off and do some kind of you know pro bono work yeah. or you know P, it was like a PR thing for the firm. And really, they hoped all the transactional attorneys would apply for this because they were all not busy. <laughs> and that's not what happened. All the litigators applied for it. And so I remember my, the head of my department saying to me, you're too busy. You can't take a year off. And I said, it's just a year. Please just let me take a year. And I really, you know, I really looked at this as a, an amazing opportunity. And I really made up my mind that I was going to do everything yeah. I can for the year to really decide what I was going to do after yeah. that. And so uh, what ended up happening was I ended up not leaving to write a, a novel. I ended up, I was writing, uh, I was working for an advocacy group and I was doing right. a lot of writing, but I started to get a novel idea yeah. about um, a woman who is really torn about every decision she has made up until that point, thinking right. that, that she had sort of made wrong decisions. So right. it, it was an idea that was translated into a, a, a different story, but it was, not surprisingly based on a time in my life where yeah. I was suddenly questioning every decision I'd made. That's right. But what I came to was I started to say to people, because so many people would say to me, you know, don't you feel like you're throwing all of that time away? All right, that right. You law. And I, and I, and I realized one day, you know, nobody has ever asked me if I'm going back to law school. Like you graduate from law school, you move on. Nobody right. says, Oh, aren't you dying to go back to law school? Right. And it's, same thing with practicing law. I did it for 13 years. Yeah. That wasn't a waste of time. That's right. And That's you can graduate from it without regretting it, without saying that was a mistake. I never should have done that. Yeah. I don't feel that way. Yeah. I feel that it was exactly what I was supposed to be doing at the time. And then when I wasn't supposed to be yeah. doing it, I got out in the nick of time. You so, know, it's a, it's a great point because th th there's growth, there's development, yeah, there's yeah, phases yeah. in life, there are seasons, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so it was the right path for me at the time, but I burned out and I, and, and I really didn't think I, I, I stayed on for a couple of years past the burnout, really yeah. thinking, well, what else do you do with yeah. a law degree? And, and, you know, a decade of experience at Scadden Arps, you stay at a law firm. What else do you do? And it wasn't until I got out and I took the year and I got sort of, you know, I got to breathe. Right. That I started to understand there was so much more I could do with, with my law degree. What did burnout look like? What did that mean to you? 
Um, <laughs> what did it mean? Oh my goodness. Uh, well, I will say by that point I had, by 2009, I had, uh, three children yeah. who were all under the age of five. Yeah. Um, I was not sleeping. I had a husband who was, I put through medical school, residency and fellowship. Yeah. So he was not involved yeah. <laughs> in, right. in our, right. in our home life. And I was not sleeping. I was not eating. I was miserable. I was, uh, you know, missing things that the, that the, you know, the kids were doing and I was missing out on things I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was sort of at work pretending I didn't have a home life because that was sort of the ex expectation of how you get ahead. And I remember being at one of my end of the year reviews and the partner saying to me, you know, Amy, you are amazing. No one would ever know you have a family. It's fabulous. <laughs> it's fabulous. And I <laughs> was thinking to myself, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it right. Okay. Yeah. And then I sort of, you know, I think I started to s sort of walked out of there and said, okay, this is actually not where I want to be right now. I don't want to be in a place where I'm being congratulated because yeah. I'm hiding the fact that I have a family so well. And if, if you didn't have family, we did Liz Brown on a podcast about this and about being a woman in this situation. If you didn't have a family, totally different. Would you have stayed in the law? Do you think you still would have been burned out? It's so hard to know because um, I, I my gut tells me that I still would have been burned out because I had absolutely no life outside of the law firm. Yeah. And so I have to believe that just as a person, as a human, yeah. um, that would have been too much for yeah. me, for me personally. Yeah. I know people who retire in that life lifestyle. Right. Um, but I also think that it is a lifestyle that, that wears you out. Yeah. And, um, and I saw it and I saw it happen to a lot of people. And for, like I said, for a long time, I really couldn't come up for air to even think about leaving, even though I was feeling unhappy and I was feeling like I really wasn't, not even balanced. I wasn't really achieving. I didn't really have a personal life outside right. of work. Right. Um, I really also couldn't come up for air long enough to figure out what I would even do about that. And so, like I said, when I took, when I took the year sabbatical, I really, I always call that like the year of me. Yeah. I didn't do anything I didn't want to do. I didn't read books. I didn't want to finish. I didn't eat food. I didn't want to eat. I said, this is my year. I have to figure out what I'm going to do at the end of this year. And if I'm going to go back to practicing law, that's fine. I need to be comfortable with that decision. It'd but, be an authentic, sincere decision. Like you absolutely. really want to do it. You're not BSing yourself. Yeah, exactly. It's not, it's not a, I didn't want at the end of that year, I didn't want to feel like I am going back because I don't know what else to do. I didn't want to do that. Now I wanted, there's so much in your book I want to get to, but before we do, I want to ask you a similar question we asked Liz Brown, which was for our women listeners, you know, there's so much they're wrestling with, with, well, I have a family and that's a cop out and men don't have to leave, but women have to leave or feel they do, or where they don't have a family, but there's a glass ceiling and it's an old boys network and so on. So I, my advice to all people who, who deal with that is like you said, if you're burnt out and you're done, move on. It's growth. Be sincere with yourself. Don't worry about external look inward like you did on your year of me and just do what's best sincere for you as opposed to seeing, well, if I didn't have a family, this wouldn't happen and so on. But so specifically for women listeners who are just not law school, who are 10 years in thoughts, advice on if they're burnt out, how just the mindset shift that they can get comfortable with, with making a change. Yeah. Well, two things. First of all, I will tell you, that in looking at all of the, Liz Brown has said this, that, you know, every transitioning lawyer she has talked to has always said um, that they never regret doing it. They just regret it, not doing it sooner. <laughs> and, and I have found that to be the case for the majority of people that I have interviewed as well, except for one demographic. There's one demographic that is torn about the yeah. exodus from the law. And that demographic is primarily women, but yeah. Uh, people who leave the law to become full-time caregivers. Right. And, and I was a little troubled to, to find that, to find that out. Okay. And so I've explored why that's, that's true. And I have a couple of hypotheses for yeah, why that's true. Yeah. This is One great. of them is that a lot of these women are leaving jobs that they do love and they could love prematurely. They're being yeah. forced out prematurely because of the culture. Um, and another is because 
a lot of these women who leave the practice of law are feeling such a struggle to, um, and, and, and I'm using women, but of course it happens for men too. Yeah. But there's, there's such a struggle and there's such a pull between responsibilities at home, responsibilities as caregiver and response. And maybe it's to a parent or maybe it's, you know, an elderly parent or to a child um, and the responsibilities at work. And so they make the clean break from work and they come home and they try to run their home the way they used to run their professional life. Yeah. And they burn out. <laughs> And you can't leave your role as parent, right? You can't just move on from that role. Right. So the burnout has now transferred over there. So two things. So one, I recommend for um, people who are struggling with this, do not run out the door. Yeah. Try first to do some sort of flex time or part-time yeah. position. I did do that first before I left. Yeah. Um, it didn't work for me because part-time didn't it didn't mean part-time. Yeah. Um, but there are, but I have heard success stories and, well, and I a montage legal there's yes. a lot of new models that you can do part-time. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm big fans of them. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is if it doesn't work and you do leave, I, I have found, and this was the case for me because even when I left, I still, um, I actually worked, I, I joined a startup company and I worked on the executive team of a startup company. I worked mm -hmm. remotely and it was not practicing law and it was a totally different um, position, but it was something that I did um, sort of on the side of writing and so, sort of something that I transferred a little bit of my professional um, goals over towards. And if you have something other than full-time caregiving, some sort of professional venture, that you are working on, you are less likely statistically to burn out in um, your transition over to caregiver. God. So I think that's, that's really great. good. I think there's a, there's this feeling of I'm leaving, I got to get out. And now I'm going to just throw myself 100% into my new role as yeah. full-time caregiver. Yeah. And it doesn't universally translate yeah. to complete happiness. Yeah. <laughs> It's great advice. I, in Leave Law Behind, you know, people will say, well, I want to do this. I want to do that. And I'll say, volunteer first. Yeah. Yes. You yes. You, you want to get into pro bono or this. You want to leave the law for that. As opposed to that clean break, volunteer, give a few hours a week, see if you like it. Uh, and it seems yeah. like that's a similar idea. Dip your toe a bit, go part-time. Yeah. Carol Cohen from Irie Lunch calls it strategic volunteerism. And I totally believe in that. Like, do something, something that interests you, yeah. create a volunteer position around it. I think um, yeah. Nobody, I will tell you, I, you know, so I left, officially left in 2010. In seven years, not one person has ever turned down my offer to volunteer. You know, they, they do not turn down free lawyer yeah. volunteer work. They don't yeah. do it. So it's a great way to learn about new business, businesses, yeah. to learn about nonprofit organizations you might be interested in, um, to teach, yeah. to, to do a variety of things. Yeah. No, that's great. And so for those men or women who are looking to transition out, take care of children, or they're, now the home front is different, uh, take it step by step. Uh, have, have a bridge, like a bridge loan, have a bridge yes. of some kind mm -hmm. and, and, and see how it works. So mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Um, okay, great. I wanted to touch on that. Uh, it, it's something that comes up a lot. There are so many, you, you know, it's funny, the more I'm becoming an online marketer and we're in, in, into the psychology of people, you realize that so much of our decisions are based on emotion. It's not logic. Yeah. It's based on emotion. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, particularly in, in leaving. Okay. So one thing that jumped out again, the book lawyer interrupted, um, you can find this on Amazon. We're going to have links around the podcast, uh, that you can easily check it out. Really think everyone should, should take a look at this book that Amy wrote, uh, with the, with the ABA. One thing that I found interesting was with, um, career service offices at law firms. Uh, they do a great job. Uh, I, I had had a lot of, of success and help from, from my alma mater. But one thing that you mentioned here and that I saw on my own was like there is not or, or there's, they're just beginning to really help lawyers look at opportunities, to get that proficiency to help attorneys look at opportunities that are outside of the law, that are law, non-law, hybrid, alternative careers. You know, that muscle isn't really very strong in this career services. Why are you, why is that? Um, are you seeing positive development here? Is that something they even want to unpack that for me? 
Okay. Well, okay. So first of all, I was so grateful when you, when we talked about this and, and your contribution to Lawyer Interrupted on this issue was so invaluable because your experience with Hastings was so exciting and they, their career office really is a pioneer in this area. And what I found, what I, what I hoped to be true wasn't the case, was that that was sort of becoming this widespread trend among other law schools. And it's not yet. Um, and here's why. And here's the answer. Um, because, and I've heard this from many reputable law schools, career offices, who have said this to me, um, they are under tremendous pressure to place law graduates and recent law alum, even up to five years out at JD required and then JD preferred positions. Their rankings are based on that uh. at, in large part. And it is very, there's a, a great deal of pressure on, on every law school career office to place their, not just graduates, but alum in huh. JD required positions. So when you look at the statistics, the ABA actually requires that they list their, their statistics for job placement, JD required, JD preferred, and other. Um, and they use that for rankings. And so um, there's, you know, because of the reality of, of the economics and because of the, the trends in hiring, um, because they've had to look at other options for their graduates just to at least place, place them in employment and help them get employment, they're a little bit more willing to look at some of those other positions. But the emphasis for them is always going to be until that is changed in the ABA uh -huh. ranking system on JD required. So what I actually have found is that the most, um, the most exciting uh, sort of new trend for, for places for alum, yeah. if not recent graduates, to look for alternative careers yeah. is actually at their local bar associations. And a lot of, there are a lot of now lawyer in transition committees that were always around. They were right. always, catering to the demographic of the retired lawyer, right? Oh, right, right, right. They have now evolved. Those lawyers and transition committees have now evolved and are now catering to a different demographic, people who are transitioning at all different levels of their career. And those have become really great resources. Yeah, and so they, I got it. So the law schools get their rankings, but downstream a little bit, you go a few blocks downtown to the your local lawyer in transition bar committee uh, right. office and they'll help you do what you wish the law firm uh, law schools had helped earlier yeah like upstream i got it <laughs> okay right okay so again that for our listeners that is their local bar chapter may have a what is it called lawyers in transition I, they're typically called something like that the transition lawyers in transition committee um either at the state level or the county level. Um, and I would encourage, I, I know some groups who didn't have it in their local bar, associ bar association and created one. There's Great. a demand for it. Um, so, but yeah, in a lot of places, in a lot of places it's dormant because yeah. it was always sort of meant to cater to retired attorneys exactly. and maybe it's become sort of dormant, but Many, many bar associations are, are revitalizing this. Great, great point. I'm gonna look into that here locally. Okay, great. Uh, let, let's go even more upstream. I think, is it Art, Art Bosell, I think, who you interviewed in the book, he mentioned that law students, and this hit home for me, still go to law school for the wrong reasons. Yeah. I went, I didn't think critically about it. I thought it was going to be an extension of college. I always say I'm a Jewish kid who didn't like blood, so I didn't go to medical school. I just went to law school. Like, I really, my friends were going. I did not think critically about it. Right. Uh, and I, where I see it leave law behind is so many people 10, 12, 15 years say, why am I unhappy as a lawyer? It's because, you know, we didn't think critically at the beginning. Um, what are those reasons that you've seen, the, these wrong reasons? I mean, I know from my own experience, but what else do you see that I know I probably our listeners are probably nodding their head. What, what are yeah. some of these wrong reasons? Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, they are, they are societal pressure. Yeah. They are family pressure. You know, Liz Brown said this, law, lawyer jokes aside, the law is still an incredibly respected position. And I will tell you, all transitioning attorneys that I interviewed for the book, all um, successfully transitioned who have moved into a different profession, right? All of them say their legal training was the differentiator that helped yeah. them succeed, right? Yeah. It is a valuable degree. It is valuable training. People understand that. People respect it. Um, but they're confused about what it means. So I really think that I've, 
my, in my opinion, um, people still go to law school thinking that they want to practice law. Right. And the reality is that they don't really know what that means. And they don't really understand what drudgery that, that entails. That's and so right. while some people are understand it and, and are willing to accept it as part of the job, um, others are blindsided by that. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have statistics like over 50% of practicing lawyers want to leave the practice of law. But what we, what the goal of Lawyer Interrupted is and what the goal of, of what I'm trying to message is, is that the law degree, you don't go to law school because you don't know what else to do, even though a lot of us have done that. Like I said, I always wanted to be a lawyer, but I really don't think I understood exactly what that meant. That's right. Until I really did get in there. Um, but the idea that you go to law school because you don't know what else to do is, is a popular is a popular decision for many. Well, I don't want to go to medical school and um, I'll go to law school. Right. But, but the reality is that it, it's, it's, it is a wonderful training and it is a wonderful degree if you really do understand that you're going to use it for something more versatile than practicing law. That's right. Um, and law school actually does, I, I have found this to be true, that law school actually does attract creative people and then it doesn't give them an outlet for that creativity. That's, so yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people sort of go to law school thinking, well, I'm a creative problem solver. I have a lot of really exciting ideas about um, a lot of things and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go practice law and I'm going to argue. And, um, but the reality is law school actually trains you to be an employee. That's, that's right. you know, that's sort of how the law school model has been structured. It, that is changing. That yeah. there is a trend away from that model slowly, very slowly, but surely. Yeah. Where Entre we're going to start entrepreneurism. Entrepreneurial. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Entrepreneurism is not taught. Uh, running a business is not taught. You know, one thing Adam Ouellette and my, my, our podcast partner talks about is how to automate a business for, for an attorney, whether big law or small, how to reach out to customers, how to connect with them, how to message, how to position. You don't see any of that in law school. No, this is what's so crazy to me. When I went to law school, I'm dating myself a little bit, but, it, but I talked to recent law school grads now and, I, and the culture has not changed. Yeah. Opening your own practice, starting your own practice was something you did because you couldn't get another job. Right. That was the perception. You right. were not trained to open your own law firm. However, in the real world, when you look at the, the, the longevity of practicing attorneys, the practicing attorneys who are lasting the longest without burnout in the field are solo practitioners right. and general practitioners who are running their own business. That's right. And, and so it is a highly desirable sector of the field. And yet nobody is preparing anybody for, to do that in law school. It's, it's, it's crazy irony. It, yes. It's, it's crazy. I, the same thing here in San Francisco is I know a number of friends from law school and friends of friends and small practices doing really well. Yeah. Uh, you know, really well, the two, 300, 300, 150 to 400,000, right? Like it's, yeah. And, and, and it's San Francisco, an expensive city, but they're, they're able to take care of themselves. They got extra spending. They're not making $1.7 million, but I don't even know if that's what they want. They didn't want to go right. to the big firm. So, yeah. Well, Art, Art um, Bissell made this other point to me in the book that is so, that I quote in the book that is, makes so much sense to me. The um, amount of job satisfaction is actually directly uh, related to how close you are in the chain of commerce from the client. So, those attorneys that you're talking about that are actually having autonomy in their practice yeah. and are meeting with the clients and are seeing the results firsthand are experiencing a lot more job satisfaction right. than attorneys like me at Skadden who were completely removed from the client and, you know, were yeah. basically dealing with this long sort of bureaucracy right. that That's removed right. you from the, from the actual issue. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. So career services, uh, some are getting better, go down to the local bar committee. Um, but also there's this idea of don't be afraid to be the entrepreneur, the creative business person that inside of you. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are stories of people who've left? Uh, I have them at Leave Law Behind. I love talking about them. Um, it's not a negative thing. It is like, oh, they scrapped the law or so on. But really it's, it's really stories of people who have gone through the journey who have found opportunities, jobs, careers, roles that, that are a real fit with them. What, who have you seen? Tell us some. Well, you know, what's funny. I, so when I did leave, I started, um, 
as I said, I, I joined this executive team. I was doing some writing and I was doing just a little bit of business work for this group, this startup company that was, had, um, they had funding from a venture capital firm in Nashville, out of Nashville. And they were moving from a print magazine to a virtual content site. And it was called, at the time it was called Hybrid Her. Well, it was actually called Hybrid Mom and then they changed to Hybrid Her. And it was really a resource that was promoting women entrepreneurs and um, sort of giving them a platform and also helping them. It, basically, I was working on the, the portion where we were creating an e-commerce component to the site and we were basically providing a platform for them to sell goods and market themselves right. and help them market themselves. And the fascinating thing was I started to realize there was a really large demographic of designers and entrepreneurs that were actually female, former lawyers. Mm -hmm. And one of them that I met, which, and she was so, she was really just starting her business at the time was Jill Donovan. And she was, uh, um, she was a litigator and she actually was an adjunct law professor also in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she had made up her mind that she didn't want to, she wanted to have a life outside of work. Yeah, yeah. So every year she would do something. She would challenge herself to learn something new. And so one year she learned how to play poker and she entered poker tournaments. One year she learned how to tap dance and she entered the recital at the end of the yeah. year. One year she learned Russian and she went to Russia for an immersion program. And one year she took up jewelry design. And she always said that was the thing she always knew she was going to come back to. And she started designing these, these bracelets and she was doing it in her home and she uh, started somehow getting, she really didn't know anyone. She didn't yeah. know anyone famous, but she started getting them to um, publicists. And she, there was a, an emerging singer at the time who was also from Tulsa. Her name was Miranda Lambert. Now she's a very well-known yeah. country singer, but at the time she was just up and coming also. And so Jill literally was in her basement putting together um, bracelets to gift to this singer. And ultimately Miranda Lambert was photographed wearing the bracelets like right. in, entertainment tonight right. and her business you know she took advantage Jill took wow. advantage of it and yeah. started photographing you know started putting those photographs all over her website and started really marketing herself as um, a celebrity designer and started wow. getting her cuffs to other people she has one of the fastest according to Facebook one of the fastest growing um, jewelry companies wow. on media because now she actually does a lot of her um, selling on via social media and she has a lot of closed groups and she has like a cult following. Yeah. And, um, and she left the practice of law and she left her, her teaching gig. And she is to me a fat now that's like a very exponential yeah. success story. Right. But again, a person who did it on the side of her day job really made it a point to find a hobby and interest outside of practicing right. law. Um, honed it, refined it, used her creativity. And she's a person who always says to me, I always, this is a woman who, and by the way, her celebrity designs have now run the gamut. She's got pages and pages of celebrity sightings on her page. Now she was Oprah Winfrey wore her bracelet on, on a cover, the cover of, Oh, okay. I mean, now she's like a legit right. celebrity jewelry designer, but she says she always leads with I'm a lawyer yeah. when she's doing deals, yeah. when she's at a bank, when she's, that's where she gets res you know, respectability. So, but, and she always says, that's the differentiator. Like, I don't regret that for a minute, but I okay. won't go back to practicing law. I have this fabulous business now. She's, you know, definitely an entrepreneur times a hundred. And she, um, you know, she just really used her creativity and sort of, you know, created this very unique business model, but. Great. So two things jump out at me from that story. That, that is it, it, such a great story. And one is you can always still call yourself an attorney. Uh, one big thing that one big fear and obstacle that attorneys have in leaving the law that I see with people I work with is just that I wanted to keep calling myself an attorney. I've wanted to do since I was 10 years old or I put so much right. investment into it. So I need to call myself an attorney. If I leave the law, I can't. Well, right. You can. And if you put you glasses can. on, they're going to think you're even smarter. So you, you, even if you leave the law, you can have your cake and eat it too. And I think the other point that got me was, you know, th th she did a lot of other things. You know, she, she learned Russian. She learned poker. There were probably a lot of others. So people say, well, she started jewelry and, you know, it was an overnight success and good oh. lucky for her. No. No, far from it. 
She could have started an online Russian course, or she could have right. taught, taught mothers how to, how to play poker. I mean, there were all these things that she tried that didn't turn into anything. And right. then it was the, the fifth or the X number thing she did, which is the jewelry that actually happened. So it's just like Woody Allen said, it's just getting out there. It's, That's life, right. Life is getting out there. It was not over. This is the end of part one. Part two will continue next week. So make sure you join us for the continuation of this amazing interview. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.